history of wristwatches uh, takes us all the way back to 1571. And that's when Elizabeth I of England received what uh, many say is the very first wrist, uh, wristwatch by Robert Dudley. And it was described as an arm watch at the time. By the mid-19th century, most watchmakers were producing a number of different uh, wristwatches, but they were marketed primarily to women as bracelets. It wasn't until the end of the 19th century when men began to uh, wear uh, watches on their wrist, and primarily it was the military uh, men that wore them, and they found an advantage in battle because they could take and synchronize their watches with one another in order to carry out their plans or some operation. Instead of using signals, they could know at a certain time they were to, to initiate uh, the plans. And so that's where they began. And then finally, it became a, a fashion statement, a fashion uh, trend. Now today, watches come in all kinds of styles, and they really are incredibly sophisticated. We have smart watches today uh, that many people wear, which are really nothing more than uh, miniature computers, and they do far more than just tell time. Uh, in fact, when I was growing up, some of you will remember this, there was a comic book kind of hero named Dick Tracy. And you may remember Dick Tracy, the thing that was so cool, I remember as a kid about Dick Tracy, is he had a wristwatch phone. And you could talk to him on his, we never imagined that that day would actually come. But today you can talk to one another on your uh, smart wristwatches if you have those. In fact, uh, how many of you here today have a watch on this morning? How many of you have a wristwatch on this morning? Many of you are wearing watches uh, today. Now, whatever you use to mark time is a helpful tool, right? I mean, some folks now, they just rely on their phones or their iPads or their computers to see what time it is. Uh, but whatever you use to mark time is a helpful tool because time is something that you cannot replace. You can't restore lost time. You, you can't uh, purchase any more time. It can be maximized, the time that you have, and obviously it can be wasted, but you can't restore it. And so uh, uh, since our time is limited, uh, it is of incredible value. And that's why uh, knowing what time it is is very important. Now, the Bible teaches that time is short. In Proverbs 27 and verse 1, it says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. And we've certainly experienced that in this year, haven't we, in 2020? And uh, Paul, writing in Ephesians 5 and verse 16, says, Make the best use of the time because the days are evil. And then the psalmist in Psalm chapter 90 and verse 12 writes and says, Lord, teach us to number our days that we might have a heart of wisdom. The fact is physical time has spiritual implications for our life. And in the passage this morning that we're going to look at, the psalmist calls to the people of God to reconnect with God while there is still time. Now, that's an important call no matter what age you live in because we're constantly needing to maintain our connection with God. And there is only so much time in which we can do it. And God tells the people in, that he's writing to here, uh, his people, uh, to reconnect because if they did not, there would be consequences. Now, this morning, I don't want to talk to you so much about time in terms of a practical, here's why you ought to manage your time, but I want to talk to you more in the eschatological sense of time. That is, there's a limited amount of time. God has put us on this planet, and there are some things that should be consistent in our life because time is short and time uh, is uh, limited. So uh, what time is it? Well, it's time to do several things, and that's really kind of the message of Psalm uh, 81. If you're physically able to do so, why don't you stand with me this morning? We'll read just three verses out of the text, and I'll give you some of the context as well. In verse 8, the psalmist says, Hear, O my people, while I admonish you, O Israel, if you would but listen to me, there shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. Now, Father, we 
want to open not just our mouths to be filled, we want to open up our hearts to you and our minds to you this morning. And we pray, God, that you will fill them both with your holy truth and that you will use it, Father, to challenge us. And as we often ask, Father, transform us with the living word. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. Now, the verses prior to the verses we read are a call to celebrate the goodness of God. Verses 1 through 3 talk about the goodness of God. And you might recall last week in the message on endurance, we talked about the importance of remembering, right? You will see that a lot when God is challenging his people to make adjustments in their life. He will often point them back to where they've been so that he can say, if I was faithful to you back then, remember that and move them. So in the first three verses of this psalm, that's what the psalmist is doing, or God working and speaking through the psalmist is saying, recall the things, so many things that you can celebrate about the goodness of God. And then in verses four to seven, there's a call to com- contemplate God's deliverance. And so the psalmist talks about how God had delivered them and God had rescued them time and time again. And then the verses that we just read are really a call to an urgent initiation of a return to God. They are actually, these verses, these three verses are actually a warning to God's people. It was time for them to reconnect to the purposes and the plans uh, that God had for them. And uh, God wanted them to experience his providential protection and his providential provision over them. But there were some things that were going to have to happen. It was time for them to do some things. They had been, how should I say it, messing around. They had been messing around with the things of God. I'm going to see my grandson. I'm going to take my wife too uh, tomorrow. And uh, we're going to go up and come back on Friday. But there's a line that he has mastered now. And his mom was teasing with him. She'd tell him, give him some instruction. And then she'd say, I'm not messing around. And so now he'll go messing around. (laughs) And I want to tell you, that's what was going on with Israel. And God's people, they had just been messing around with the things of God for so long, not really taking them seriously, intertwining them with things that they should not have been doing. And consequently, they had lost the real dynamic of their relationship. And so the psalmist is calling them in these verses to initiate uh, or return to the, the things uh, that are most important to them. It's time. It was time. And there were, it was time for them to do Uh, three things. And I would say to you, it's always time to do these three things. And God, in fact, said to them, you know, if you'll open your mouth wide, I'm going to fill it. I'll talk about that in just a few moments. But he goes on now, the the post text from what we just read is that uh, he he, uh, utters these words, but my people wouldn't listen. And then he starts talking about if you don't do what I'm asking, there will be consequences. And so It's always time to do the three things that I'm going to talk about this morning, or there will always be subsequent consequences. Eventually, God will say, I'm not messing around. You're messing around, and it's time to do some business. All right, so what are they? Number one, it is always time to discern the voice of God. It is always time to discern the voice of God. Look at verse 8 again with me, if you will, where God says, hear, O my people, while I admonish you, O Israel, if you would but listen to me. He uses the word, hear and listen. He says, I'm going to admonish you. Our our world's full of voices. Would you agree with that? I mean, messages, we're bombarded by messages. And I forget, I did one time, I did some research on the number of messages that you and I uh, actually are, are poured into us in a day And it's absolutely astounding. Our world is full of voices. There are so many voices and they're all, all of them are competing for our attention. And that's why it's easy to get distracted and to miss the most important voice of all because of all of the different voices. And now every once in a while, you and I need to ask ourselves, what voices am I listening to? We, don't, we get used to the, the volume of voices and we quit thinking about the most important. Every once in a while, we ought to just stop. Just pause sometimes and say, God, what voices 
uh, uh, what voices am I listening to? Many of our spiritual struggles are caused by our inability, listen, to hear the voice of God in the midst of so many voices in our world. Now, I didn't say we don't want to hear the voice of God. My guess is most of God's people have said, do you want to hear the voice of God? They're going to go, yeah, I want to hear the voice of God. People say this, uh, one of the most asked questions, I've told you this uh, for all these years, one of the most asked questions of pastors today is how can I know the will of God? What they're really saying is how can I hear what God, uh, God's plans are? It's another way of asking how can I hear God? I want to hear God. I, I don't know too many Christians unless they're living in outright sin and know it who don't want to hear the voice of God. Amen. Amen. So it's not about want to, right? It's not about, do I want to hear God? What it is about is, have I lost the ability to hear the voice of God because there are so many voices around me? How do you know which voices you're listening to? I I was working on the message. I thought, how how do we know which voices we're listening to? Uh, Because I think the people of God here that the psalmist is talking to had lost the ability to distinguish the voice of God. And so I got to thinking, how, how do we do that? How do we lose that? We're well-intentioned, but we lose the ability to hear. Well, I'm going to give you three questions that I arrived at, that if you'll answer these three questions, you'll know what voices you're hearing. You'll know which voices are having the impact on you. Question number one, ask yourself, what shapes my opinions? Now, everybody has an opinion, Right. <laughs> I mean, think about it. There's a whole industry on radio and on television that has arisen over the last 50 years because of opinions. Talk shows, talking heads, we call them. It's on radio, it's on television, and it's opinions. And by the way, uh, uh, one, uh, uh, the shows uh, uh, um, typically will have one opinion and then an opposite, an opposing opinion, and back and forth it goes, that sort of thing. Ask what shapes your opinions. I didn't say what is the right opinion. I just said ask what shapes your opinions. Is it friends? Is it television? Is it media, papers, magazines? Is it a family? Uh, How about this? Is it social media today? I'm afraid too many opinions are being shaped by what is said on social media. What shapes your opinions? Here's the second question. What determines my convictions? What shapes my opinions? And then secondly, what determines my convictions? Now, convictions and opinions are not the same thing. Um, Convictions are something that adjusts your life. Convictions are something that are foundational to you. So ask yourself, what sh- now, by the way, what determines your convictions may be your opinions. And that's really dangerous. But what is it that determines your convictions? What is it that you say, these are my convictions, they, these are the foundations of my life, and here's how I are, have arrived at these convictions, and I will not give my convictions up for somebody else. I built my life on these convictions. For the Christian, listen, I can tell you very simply, there's only one source of conviction, and that is the living Word of God. And if you use anything else to build your convictions upon, you're building your house on sand. So ask yourself, what determines my convictions? Now, you may may be honest with yourself because you may say, well, it's the Bible. Well, how influential then is it upon your life when you walk out of this building? How does it adjust how you respond uh, to the world around you, to your family, to, to uh, friends, all of those sorts of things? And then here's the third question to ask yourself. If you want to know what voices you're listening to, ask, what affects my commitments? What affects my con- commitments? Now, you, I think you're smart enough to see there's some overlap in all of these, right? Your conviction should affect your commitments. But if you've lost the ability to distinguish and discern the voice of God, guess what? You may find out that your convictions are whimsical. You may find out that your commitments 
are lackluster or based more on your feelings. And I will tell you today, for a lot of people out there, their commitments are purely emotive. They're just based on how they feel in the moment. They'll make a commitment based on their feelings or, or they'll keep a commitment based on how they feel. I want to tell you something. By the way, just uh, uh, the past couple of weeks, I've been doing some uh, premarital counseling with some sweet couples uh, that are getting ready to get married. And, and uh, one, of, uh, 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 one of the recent counseling sessions, I told this couple what I tell every couple, and that is feelings are good in a relationship. In fact, a, a relationship without feelings is not a good relationship. It's not healthy. But I said, I want to tell you something very important that our world doesn't understand, and that is your relationship is built on commitment, not on feelings. Because the feelings come and go. In fact, I, I said, there's going to be a day, and I told her, where you're going to look at him and say, today I don't like you, but I'm committed to you. Amen. And sometimes, uh, sometimes that's the way to, it, we don't make lasting decisions in our life based on feelings. Because our feelings are not reliable. They're all over the place sometimes. But if you look today around you, and if you haven't learned to discern the voice of God, what you will often do is make commitments based on how you feel in the moment. That's a faulty way to do that. In his book, Directions, author James Hamilton shares an insight about hearing God. And he talks about how food was stored um, before refrigeration. Many of you know this, but people used ice houses to preserve. Did any of you have a family member, you know, a grandparent, a great grandparent that had an ice house uh, on their property? Some of you, I know you didn't. You know what the ice house uh, was like. Uh, it wasn't a refrigerator, but what they would do in the wintertime, they would haul large blocks of ice, usually cut from a stream or a river or something. They would put those in the ice house and they would cover them with uh, sawdust. And, um, and then they would store, you know, meat and anything they wanted refrigerated. It became their refrigerator, so to speak. And um, uh, in this particular story in, in uh, his book, Directions, he talks about uh, on one occasion, uh, a man who was working in the ice house lost his wristwatch. And he lost it somewhere in there, and he, he dug around in the sawdust trying to find it, and he couldn't find it, and some of his friends dug around, and they couldn't find it. And finally, it was time for lunch, and they broke for lunch. They went in to eat, and while they did, a little boy who had heard them talking about the lost watch went into the ice house. He shut the door behind him, and he, and he laid down on the sawdust. And uh, shortly, he comes out with the watch. And, uh, and they asked him, son, how did, you find, how did you find the watch? And the little boy said, well, I closed the door, I lay down on the sawdust, and I kept very still. And you know what he did? He heard the ticking of the watch. So how do we become skilled then at discerning or hearing the voice of God? Well, let me give you three things. Number one, we must get still. We have to get still. One of the enemies of hearing God is busyness or trying to hear God while we're engaged in 10 other things, trying to multitask and be spiritual at the same time. We have to get still. Do you know, studies show us, y'all know what they mean, the phrase multitask. It's become important in the last uh, two decades. Multitasking means what? trying to do more than one thing at a time. I can do this and I can do this. And we were even told that technology was going to revolutionize that uh, for us. So we could be doing this and this and this and all of these. So all technology has done is added another thing to manage in our lives. And I love it and I think it's useful. But multitasking, listen, do you know they've done studies that say nobody can truly multitask? Something suffers when you multitask. You can't give your best to something if you multitask. Um, now, I, I'm not telling you don't try it if you want to try it, but the fact is a lot of times the reason we haven't developed the skill to hear God is because we're trying to spiritually multitask. And the Bible wants us and urges us and counsels us to, to get still, to get quiet. In fact, listen, did you know... Mark 135 says that Jesus did the very same thing. Jesus understood how essential it was to get quiet, get still, get alone. 
before the Father, it says in verse 35, Mark chapter 1, and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. He got away. He got alone. You talk about people that were pulling. This was during his popularity, and people were pulling and tugging on him. All Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? Because what Jesus could do for them. But even Jesus knew, if I, I've got to have some downtime with God. I've got to get still with the Father. And so he would rise up early and get away to a solitary, it says a desolate place. And then the psalmist in Psalm 46, 10 says, be still, be still and know that I am God. The word still, by the way, in that passage means to cease. It means to stop. It means to discontinue. And if you're going to train yourself to be able to distinguish the voice of God, you're going to have to get still. If you, if you get still, uh, then you have a, a Uh, put yourself in a posture where you can hear God and hear the voice of God. The second thing you're going to have to do is not only get still, we must be quiet. We must learn to practice silence so we can listen to God. Just like that little boy went in the ice house, he practiced being quiet. The way he heard the watch and found the watch was he got quiet. And we have to do the same thing so that we can listen well, listen, when you, when you go into the presence of God, you don't have to do all the talking. It took me a long time to learn that sometimes the best time I have with the Lord is when I just keep my mouth shut. And that's hard to do if you're a preacher. And just get before quiet and, uh, uh, God and just be quiet. Amen. Just stop long enough. Get still. Be quiet. And say, God, what do you want to say to my heart? I love the story of Elijah. Y'all remember the story of Elijah? He had just taken out all the wicked hundreds of prophets of Baal. He called down fire, done this miraculous thing. And then he became discouraged. He was tired and he was hungry. And he, he ran somewhere in the neighborhood of about 50 miles. And he came to a cave because he thought Jezebel was going to kill him. And he came to a cave and he was exhausted. You remember what he said? God, just take my life. He said, just kill me. I, I've had enough. And, uh, and God uh, uh, sent an angel to minister to him, and he slept, and he ate. And then he began to try to hear the voice of God. And he couldn't. There was an earthquake, and there was a, a, a storms, and there were all these different things that we would have normally thought, that will be, the voice of God will be in that. But each time, the Scripture says, but God was not in the wind. God wasn't in the earthquake. And then it comes to a place in verses 12 and 13 of 1 Kings 19. It says, and after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, listen to this, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and he went out and he stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Where was the voice of the Lord? It was in the whisper. It wasn't in the earthquake. It wasn't in the wind. It wasn't in the fire. It was the whisper. When Elijah stopped running, when he rested, when he ate, and when he got quiet, he heard the whisper of God uh, for his life. Now listen, here's what I want to say to you. We so often are looking for the voice of God in the dramatic. God, if you'll just, if you'll just send down fire... Uh, and speak, God, if you'll just do this and speak. But I want to tell you that I believe God more often than not speaks in his whisper. Why? He wants to know who's really hearing. He that has ears to hear, let him do what, class? Let him hear. And so we have to get quiet. And then third, we must read God's word. Now listen, we are fortunate people today because we have the holy living word of God that we can turn to anytime we want. And I want you to know something. The Bible is the voice of God in written form. And we know that. Paul writes in 2 Timothy and says, all scripture is breathed out by God and it is profitable for teaching, for correcting, for reproof, for training in righteousness. Why? So that we may be competent and complete for every good work of God. 
We have to read God's word. If you want to distinguish the voices, if you want to know the most important voice, you're going to have to spend time with the voice of God already revealed to you. He's already given it to you. And that's why, by the way, if you'll get quiet and you'll get still and you'll get in God's word, it is not unusual for you to come across a passage sometime. You say, I've read that a hundred times, but I don't know why, but it just jumped out to me. Today, it jumped. you know what's happening? The spirit, of, you got still long enough and quiet long enough and in the word long enough and the spirit of God took it and said, here's what God is saying to your heart. Just yesterday, Allison and I were talking. She came to me. She said, I want to share something with you. She said, I, I just, and she said, I, I think the Lord just gave, gave me a word. And so she begins to share. She says, what do you think? I said, sounds like a word to me. Because he did exactly what I'm just talking about, about this, about how God will speak to us from his word. In fact, Paul writes in Romans 10 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You want to enlarge your faith, spend time in the word of God. And by the way, implied in reading the word of God is doing the word of God. Be, be doers of the word, not hearers only. And like the story of Elijah, hearing a word from God makes all the difference in the world in our futures. It does. And in fact, a weak faith is frequently the result of not hearing God, not reading the word of God, you see, will actually work against your ability to discern the voice of God amidst all the other voices of your world. And so what he was saying to them is, it, it's time for my people to hear my voice. It was then, and I want to just tell you today, it always has been. It's still time. And this is something active. I would say it's in the present tense. That means that we are to hear God's voice and we are to continue hearing God's voice. It is a part of our, it is always time to be listening for God. Here's the second thing I share with you this morning. It's also always time to deal with the enemy of God. Look at verse nine, there shall be no strange God among you and you shall not bow down to a foreign God. You see, God's people in this passage, they had done something. They had allowed the mixture of pagan idolatry to be accepted, in fact, even practiced within their own worship of God. You got that? So they had allowed the uh, religions of the world to intermingle with their own faith. Oh, you, that's your way. This is my way. Sounds a whole lot like the, um, the, the world we're living in today. You, that's your way. This is my way. But, you know. And that's what they had happened, in fact, and that's what they had allowed. And because they weren't listening to the word of God, they couldn't distinguish the pagan, uh, paganism that had infiltrated uh, among them and in their worship. So they allowed the intermingling of pagan and pagan worship to go along with their own worship. We're being told that today, by the way, that everybody needs to, to you just need to allow for every conceivable kind of aberrant worship and behavior because one way is as good as another. Now, it's important for us to define what an idol is, right? I mean, this is idolatry. And if you're going to deal with the enemy of God, it's important to define what an idol is. It's it, because Jesus said no man can serve two masters. So let me give you a biblical, what I think is a biblical definition. It represents the biblical idea uh, of an idol, all right? Here, here's, here's, I think, a, a concise kind of way of saying it. An idol is anything that controls your passion your possessions, and your practice. An idol is anything that controls your passion, your possessions, and your practice, how you act, how you operate. In other words, anything that has greater influence over you than Christ is an idol. Anything. Again, because Jesus said no man can serve two masters. And let me tell you, let me tell you how some others have defined it. Martin Luther, the great reformer, said an idol is whatever claims loyalty that belongs to God. You get that? Whatever claims loyalty that belongs to God. Augustine, one of the church fathers, said idolatry is worshiping anything that ought to be used or using anything that ought to be worshiped. That's good, isn't it? Uh, idolatry is worshiping anything that ought to be used and using anything that ought to be worshiped. We can use God. That's what he, he's saying. And then J. McMath said idolatry is... That for which I would give anything and accept nothing in exchange 
is the most important thing in my life. Whatever I would, I would give anything for and accept nothing in exchange for is the most important thing in my life, he says. And whatever that is, that's my God. So how do you deal with idols? A couple of things that will help you deal with idols. Number one, you've got to recognize them. Write that down. You've got to recognize them. And that means, again, you've got to be brutally honest and recognize what controls the, your p- pursuits and your, your, p- uh, your passions. Israel had become so tolerant of paganism that they lost the ability to see the pagan idols' influence in their lives. They had lost the ability to do that. Now, with that in mind, I put something on your outline this morning. What idols do you battle What idols do you battle? Now, I'm not going to fill your blanks in. That's for you to do. And uh, then you're to turn them in. No, that's for you. That's just private introspection. Look, but be honest with yourself. What idols? I don't know. Is it success? Is it relationships? Is it money? Hey, here's one in America, sports. Big time. You see, the, the idols are still there. They've just changed shape. See, in, in, when the psalmist was writing, they had all kinds of idols. I mean, they, they had every conceivable kind of idol, but they were in little statue form, and they reflected a kind of action that resulted in a kind of worship of that idol. They did crazy things, bizarre things uh, in, in obedience to that idol. Uh, the shape has changed. My guess is uh, we don't have a lot of those kinds of idols. I would hope we have none of those kinds of idols But the fact is, we still have idols, hello, and we still battle with idols. Our culture has thrust all kinds of idols, and they don't call them that. But they're things that are vying for control of our life. And they affect our money. They affect our time. They affect our actions and our activities, all of those sorts of things. And many things that are idols in our lives, listen, are neutral in and of themselves. They're neutral. The problem is when we allow these things to control us and direct us and to rule our life. And so we have to recognize them. We have to be honest. And so that's for you to do. That's a little homework or you can do it here, whatever. But, but think about what idols do you battle with? Then number two, surrender daily to Christ. Once you recognize them, here's the next uh, step to take to deal with idols. Surrender daily to Christ. Idols are usually things that are self-serving and all about us. So every day we have to do something Jesus counseled us to do. We have to determine to die to ourselves and live for Christ. That's why Jesus said daily, take up your cross and deny yourself. Daily. Jesus understood that. It's not something say, okay, I've dealt with the idols. They won't be back. Yes, they will. Unless you die and surrender to Christ daily. You're making him Lord every day. He, you are Lord of my life today. You're, you are my Savior, but today, again, I make you Lord. So that there's going to be something that is going to try to control me today. So I want to Christ. I want the Spirit of God, as we talked in our last series, to fill me so that uh, uh, some kind of other thing can't fill and control me. Then here's the third thing to do. Put them in their place. Deal with the enemies of God. Put them in their place. There are some things, and again, only you can uh, answer this, but there are some things in your life that might have to be eliminated. You see, there are just some things that can't coexist in your life and and can't even exist in a lesser way. You know, so, well, I'll just lessen the influence of those. No, no, there are some things in your life that you've got to eradicate. You've got to eliminate. You've just got to get rid of it. And, and until you do, they're going to uh, uh, continue to try to control you. They'll continue to rise up. But then there are some things that you just might have to isolate. Uh, they're not evil. But they need to be isolated because they're exerting too much influence in your life. Let me give you a personal example. When I was in high school, I loved basketball. I loved basketball so much. I loved football. I played both of those things, and I loved basketball so much. But I remember there, and I was a follower of Christ, and I was a growing, maturing believer. And I remember there came a point in time in basketball where I became so um, aggressive that I thought it doesn't, it doesn't represent Christ. And I would, after I'd get so bound up in the game and I, I, I would, I would uh, man, I, I just played way too aggressive. 
And I remember finally one time the Lord whispered in my heart and said, it's time for you to stop this. And I laid out. I quit playing for a season until the Lord allowed me to get that under control. Why? Because it was controlling me. Christ wasn't controlling me. And I had, everybody knew that I talked about being a follower of Christ. And guess what? It was giving Christ a bad name. There are some things in your life that you have to set aside and say, God, right now, that can't be in my life because it controls me. It, you may be able later on to bring it back in, but if it becomes an idol, you've got to deal with it. It's kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of like a Chinese woman I read about this week who was making a connection in Beijing uh, airport and uh, security went through the stuff she was carrying on and they found uh, that she was trying to take on a very expensive bottle of cognac in her carry-on bag. And since it was too late, her other luggage had been checked already, so she couldn't take the cognac. It was a $200 bottle, a $200 bottle of cognac, and I'm not advocating that, of course, but uh, she couldn't get it into her check luggage. And they said, you can't take it on. She didn't want it to go to waste. And so she stepped away and she drank the whole bottle right there. <laughs> now she had a new problem. In fact, she was so drunk, she couldn't stand up. And uh, security, out of concern for her own safety and the safety of the other passengers, refused now to allow her to board the plane and continue her journey she was escorted in a wheelchair to a room where she slept it off until family was able to show up and pick her up. Now, listen, I say that to say some things become so important to us that we have trouble letting go of them. But instead, we have to know, I can't, I can't allow this in my life because it is taking me away from the ability to follow Christ. And there are some things that may in and of themselves not be an issue, but, but in our lives they become a terrible issue and they take us down the wrong road. And if we cling to them, they're destructive to us. And that's why we have to get rid of some things and we have to isolate some other things. There's a moment in time when virtually everything we hold dear must be relinquished if we're going to continue moving forward on our journey with God. Now, if you're going to be filled and led by the Spirit, as we talked about in the last uh, 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 series, it's always going to be because you deal with idols in your life. Because the Spirit and something else will not occupy and control the same space. Something's going to control it. Now, last, I want to show you this. Last thing that it's always time to do. It is always time to depend on the provision of God. Verse 10, open wide your mouth and I will fill it. You know, we just talked about the idols, okay? And I want you to understand something. There's a connection to this statement in verse 10. Now stay with me, okay? We just talked about these idols that they needed to deal with and that we need to deal with. There's a connection to God saying, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. You see, remember they had all of these different idols they trusted for various areas of their life. They had gods of food. They had gods of agriculture. They had gods of protection. They had gods of health. They had all of these different kinds of idols. And whatever they were needing, they went to that idol and they, they prayed to those idols. And they sometimes did bizarre uh, responses to those idols. And they'd go to that idol and say, I need protection. And so whatever the ritual they had designed that went along with that idol, that's what they applied, hoping that they would then have protection. And they did that with all of these different idols. And so, so God says, deal with your idols, and then what? And then trust me. Open wide your mouth, and I'll fill it. Quit depending on all of these idols to fill you. Quit, quit depending on the idols to do what only I can do for you and what I promise to do for you. I want you totally dependent on me. I don't want you dependent on this idol and this idol and this. I don't want you dependent on any idols. I want you dependent on me alone. That's what he was saying to them. And if you, if you will deal with idols and you will trust me, then open your mouth wide and I will fill it. And by the way, the picture here is of a baby bird 
who's got its mouth open wide and its mother is feeding it. Uh, uh, just dropping food in, dropping food in. That's the picture here. It, it, the bird completely relies on the mother to amply supply its need. That's how God wants you to live, in total trust and dependence on him. He doesn't want us trusting in the things that the world says make us secure. And see, part of those voices and messages are all about if you have this or if you do this or if you gain this, you're going to be secure. And God's saying none of those things secure you. I don't want you depending on the, the, the idols of life. I want you to depend on me. I'm the only place that you could ever find ultimate security. And he invites us to live this way. Notice that again, open wide. That's an invitation, open wide. If you'll just do this, I will feel it. But then verse 11, the sad commentary is, but my people did not listen to my voice and they would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to listen, to follow their own counsel. By the way, do you know God sometimes says, if you won't listen to me, I'll eventually let you do your own thing. But with it comes the consequences. But if you'll listen to me, if you'll follow me, if you'll deal with the, the, the idols of, of your life, then open wide your mouth and let me fill it. There are so many stories about Hudson Taylor. You know, Hudson Taylor, I've talked about many times over the years. He and George Mueller, just two of my favorites. And so many, they were such great men of faith and so many miracles. And he was, of course, the famed missionary to inland China, but before he got there, he was a medical student in London. And one day as he was walking back to his flat where he lived and rented, he came upon a very poor family, and the man of that family asked Hudson Taylor to pray for his family. His family was living under the stairs at this place. There were five kids there was a mom who was so sick she couldn't even sit up. She was laid out, and the oldest child was holding a relatively newborn baby. And Hudson prayed for them, but he felt that, that he needed to help them physically, and all he had was the money for his rental. It was due the very next day, and he didn't even have enough money for his own food. He just had enough for his rental. And he gave it all to the man, every penny he had. He gave it to this man and, and he felt like that's what he ought to do. He went on home after he'd done that. And the next day, late in the morning, he heard the landlord coming up the stairs. And Hudson had prepared himself to make a passion plea to the landlord just to extend uh, his, um, his rent just a little longer. But, the, but when he opened the door up, the landlord handed him a letter and said, your rent is due today. And and he immediately turned before Taylor could make a plea to him, and he left. So T Hudson Taylor, not knowing what his next step would be, prayed, of course, God, you know, I have nothing. I gave it all to help these people. And he said, I, I need your help now. He opened the letter that the landlord had handed him. And uh, still with his own empty stomach, no money for food or anything, inside the letter there was this note. He doesn't even know from whom. It said, it said, we want you to use this money to pay your rent and buy food. Friend, I want to remind you of something. It's always time to depend on God. It's always time to depend on God. It's always time to to deal with idols, it's always time to discern the voice of God. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. That's a Christmas story, by the way. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? I close with this. If Christ would leave his throne in heaven, Merry Christmas. And if he did that out of love for you and for me, don't you think you can trust him to do exactly what he has promised to do to provide for you if you'll make sure that he's the Lord of your life, if you'll start, if you'll get still and you'll get quiet and you'll get in his word so you can hear his word and his promises to you, he'll provide as he's promised. Where does our dependence begin? 
Well, it first begins by trusting him with your soul. That is giving your heart to him, giving your life to him. And if you've never done that before, there's no greater message I could bring to you today. Those of you who are joining us by live stream and by television in this building, in this room, there's no message greater than the message I could bring is give your life to Jesus Christ. Before all of this, you got to start there. You have to give your eternal soul. You see, somebody is going to get your soul. And there's only one positive outcome. And that's when you give your soul to Jesus Christ. And so today, I want you to bow your head, close your eyes. No one's looking about in this place. If you've never given your soul, your eternal soul, if you've never given it to Christ today, you can do that. Whether you're watching by live stream, sitting in this live audience, you call out to him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The Bible says, what does that mean? Just say something like this in your heart to him, Lord Jesus. I know I'm a sinner and I know I need you. I know who you are. I even believe in my head, but I've never received you into my life. I've never given my soul to you. I've never given myself to you. And today I call out to you. I give my life to you. The one who loved me and died for me, I give my life to you. Come in and forgive me and be my savior, my Lord and my master. And one day a home with heaven, but I get to live for you now. And you begin the transforming work in my life. You may be here today watching uh, television or live stream and you say, you know, I gave my life to Christ, but these are three things that I need to do. And today I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, it's time for me to do just that. God, I'm going to start getting still and I'm going to start getting quiet and I'm going to get back in your word like never before. And God, I'm going to deal with any idols. Show me what the idols of my life are. I don't even know. They may have mixed so much with the rest of what's going on in my life that I, I can't even see them. So you show me the idols that exercise control in my life. It could be emotions, anxiety, fear, and all those kinds of things. God, you show me the idols. And I'll deal with them. I'll deal with them every day, God, if that's what I need to do by making you Lord of my life. And then... Lord, I learned to depend on you again. I used to, Lord, but I, 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 I've started trusting in my own capacities, my own abilities. I want to depend on you. I will open wide my mouth and let you fill it. Now, Lord, I pray for all of those uh, watching, those in this building who have called out to you today, whatever they've called out about, Father, I know you hear their prayers. Would you begin the wonderful new work for those who have received you as Savior, God? Would you begin this wonderful new work in their life? Get, cause them to have this renewed uh, uh, excitement about you, Father. For those who have said, God, it's time for me to do those things that we talked about uh, today, Father, would you, uh, with your Holy Spirit, would you affirm that in their hearts and would you help them as the enemy will most certainly fight them? And Lord, we love you. We thank you that you have made a way. You have made a way for us. That's Christmas. You made a way. Thank you. And Lord, let us walk in that way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will, look this way. Those of you who are joining us by live stream, let me tell you how to follow up the decision that you made today. You'll see information on your screen, a phone number, 334-384-8080. And would you let us know about your decision? If you called out on the Lord, I give my soul, I give my life to you. If you did that today, would you text the word pastor, P-A-S-T-O-R. If you'll text that word to us at that number that you see on your screen, if you'll text that word to us, we'll take it from there, okay? We're not going to hound you and harass you. That's not what we're going to do. We're going to help you. Uh, we'll contact you and give you, get you some information and get you moving in the right direction. That's all we want to do. Maybe you say, you've watched this broadcast and said, I, the day's coming, I'm going to be back in church, physically back in church. There's nothing like being in the place. And you say, there's a day coming. Would you do what literally uh, uh, scores and scores and scores of people have done over the last several months? Say, I'd like to join Ridgecrest. I'd like Ridgecrest. To, uh, this is the, the family of believers I want to be associated with and a part of. I'd like to join. Text that word, J-O-I-N, to the same number, 334-384-8080. We'll take it from there if you'd like to join. You may say, I need to be baptized. 
And we've been doing that too. We do it very carefully, but uh, we practice all the protocols, but you text that word baptized to that same number. And by the way, in the live audience, you can do that. You can use your phone and text those same words to us and we'll take it from you. You wanna join Ridgecrest? You need to be baptized, whatever it is. Uh, you text that word to us or in our live audience, you can take the tear off panel. It's on the back of your worship folder. You can tear that off and you'll see there's a place for you to say, I'd like to join Ridgecrest or today I receive Christ as my savior. or I'd like to talk with someone about that. Whatever it may be, you can do it that way. Tear it off, fold it up, drop it in the offering baskets as you leave this morning.